So thanks for the organizers for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here and uh, have the opportunity to tell you about the rather recently proposed model of random graphs, um, which has caught a lot of interest. The model is called uh, random hyperbolic graphs. Um, and the first part of my talk is just to describe slowly the model and kind of convince you that it's an interesting model. So I, I plan for this talk assuming that essentially nobody will know about random hyperbolic graphs, have heard about them before. So just to be sure if I'm mistaken or not, the show hands who has heard about random hyperbolic graphs before. Okay, good, as I kind of expected. Okay, <laughs> so, so I'll stick to the plan and just go slowly. Um, this model was introduced by Kruko, Papadopoulos, Kitsak, Padad, and Bogunia, and the names might not sound very familiar. That's probably because most of them are physicists. In fact, they were based in a, at the time where they proposed the model in a center called CAIDA. I don't know if you know it. It's a center for applied internet data analysis. And they came up with a model that uh, has uh, nice features uh, that seem to capture uh, typical properties of so-called real-world networks or complex networks. So let's be honest, we all know that these terms are just, you know, good marketing strategies for a class of graphs that no one has ever defined rigorously. Um, when people talk about complex networks, they're just kind of thinking of, well, you know, there are things like, you know, come up in the, when you kind of model a power grid or the internet, social interactions, or the relation between different components of an ecosystem. Um, and that's very ambiguous. Um, they usually have in mind some properties that these networks have, like uh, they're sparse, they're very heterogeneous, like nodes have different, belong to different classes and kind of they're not interchangeable. Um, they're locally dense, they have very small diameter. They are something called navigable, so you can find your way around them, and I'll later say more on that. And very importantly, also, they are scale-free. So that means that if you look at the degrees of the uh, nodes of the graph, they follow a power law, degree, uh, a power law distribution uh, with an exponent that empirically is always between two and three, okay? And the nice thing about random hyperbolic graphs is that it has a very formal, nice, elegant uh, uh, definition and it exhibits all of these properties. I mean, it's possible that you can come up with a complicated model where you can tune the parameters so they will exhibit all of it, but it's nice when you know, the, 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 the definition makes sense. Um, and I guess more dear to us, it's really, they're susceptible to mathematical analysis, and it's an interesting mathematical analysis. At, at least personally, I find it also, it's fun to study them. So what are this? Well, they're like random geometric graphs, but where the underlying space, instead of being Euclidean, it's hyperbolic space. This might not mean much to most, um, so let me walk you through it. So we're used to Euclidean space. You know, we live in Euclidean space. We've done Euclidean geometry since we were in elementary school. Um, but the hyperbolic space is kind of different, it's odd. So no one has ever visited hyperbolic space, we just imagine it. And it has weird features, and when people want to explain the features of hyperbolic space, they use different analogies, depending on which feature they want to explain. So some people will say, well, hyperbolic space is like a saddle surface. Others will say, no, 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 it's like a hyperboloid. Others will tell you it's, it's a lettuce, okay? And some other people say, well, it's something that you get when you knit in crochet is according to some technique. <laughs> so, there, so, so there are different views of, 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 of hyperbolic space. I, I, I will focus on one um, that I find useful for the purpose of this talk. First, let me remind you what geometric graphs are. <clears throat> so geometric graphs, you, um, you, you, you take a region of space, in this case, uh, I'm taking Euclidean space, and I'm taking this, the unit square, okay? 
And then you, nodes of your graph will be associated to points in this region. Okay, so you have drawn them in blue. So, so you can draw them in whatever color you want, but they have to be inside the square, okay? That's important. So once you have them inside the square, uh, now you, there's a parameter which is called a radius, which I'll denote by capital R. And you draw balls around the nodes. And uh, in order to figure out whether there's an edge, let's say between U and V, well, there will be an edge if there are distance at most R, capital R, from each other. So that means that U has to be in the ball of V, center at V, and V has to be in the ball center, center at U, okay? And you draw the edges, and you repeat that. I don't know if you can see the edges. Uh, but there you go, okay, I hope. Um, and that's a geometric graph, okay? So what's a random geometric graph? Same thing, but now the points are gonna be chosen uh, according to some density functions, according to some probability. And in this case, it's the uniform uh, measure, you know, just the Lebesgue measure. Um, and here, uh, it's a unit square, here is the radius uh, that I've chosen for each one of these examples. And uh, you know, you can see that there's kind of some 500, well, there are 500 points in each case, and there's sort of like a boundary effect, okay? So at the boundary, it might look different than inside, but overall, you know, if the region is very big, what you will expect is, you know, a very homogeneous graph in all directions, okay? Very homogeneous structure, so remember that. Okay, so that's, that's what geometric graphs are. What's a hyperbolic space? Um, the, as I said, there are different views. We'll start with one, which is called the Poincaré this model of, a, I will not talk about hyperbolic space. From now on, I will just talk about the hyperbolic plane. Okay, and then you can go on and generalize. So it's, it's denoted H2. And here, uh, in the Poincaré this model, hyperbolic space is seen as a, as, a, as a disk of radius one, open disk, okay? And again, the points in hyperbolic space now are inside here. There's nothing outside there. If you're seeing things outside there, that's an illusion, okay? So it's just in there, okay? And the, okay, so, so, so this is the center of the disk. These lines that you see here, they're actual lines. You know, they're called, uh, they're geodesics. It's the shortest distance between pairs of points that are in that line. Uh, they, in this model, these this geodesics are just arcs of uh, circles that are perpendicular incident to the boundary of the disk. Some fun things that you can do in hyperbolic space, if you see this line here and you see this point, you know, you see, you know, two lines that don't intersect this one, those are parallel lines to this one. Actually, you can have an infinite number of parallel lines going through that point, parallel lines to this one, okay? so that. We won't use that, <laughs> but it's, a, it's an interesting thing. That the, the most remarkable thing of, of, of this drawing is that you know, all of these regions are heptagons. You know, they, all of the sides are the same side, they're lines. And, and actually, you can tile hyperbolic space with heptagons. You cannot do that with Euclidean space. And this is, a, this, this is sort of a illustrating the fact that hyperbolic space the main feature of hyperbolic, so it's expanding very fast, okay? So you move a little bit out and you get, you know, it's not like a, the area is increasing by some polynomial, it's increasing exponentially fast. And each one of these uh, areas over here, you know, they're all, they're all heptagons of the same area. So as you can see here, this, this huge number, the area is huge over there, and still, you know, everything is within a sh relatively short distance of each other. I mean, you can always go to the origin and, ah, uh, no, 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 forget about that. I'll, I'll say more to that later. Okay. Um, the boundary is, those are like points at infinity. You know, the distance between this boundary and this X is just not an honest distance. It's a, it's a representation, it's just an infinite distance. And the relation is the following. If you are at distance Y from X, then the hyperbolic distance from, a, from, from where you are to x is, is this expression over here. 
<clears throat> okay, so, so the really important thing is that ex space expands at exponential rate. If you can think of this uh, hyperbolic space as being as a continuous analog of a regular tree. Now, if you lay down your tree in a hyperbolic space, you know, you will get a lovely drawing. You know, those leaves will not come together. You have plenty of space to lay them down. So, so you will do very nice drawings, okay? Um, so what is this model good for? For the purpose of this talk, just to illustrate this, this issue with the area, and also to make nice pictures, you know? <laughs> um, there, you know, you have, you know, all of, the, all of this gym is on Tom, they're the real thing, okay? They're not smaller, they're the real, the real stuff, okay? <clears throat> We'll use the native representation of, a, of the Euclidean plane. And in the native representation, now there's no outside in the sense of uh, this. Like all of the Euclidean space is gonna represent points in hyperbolic space. So, so all the Euclidean plane, every point, it's a point representing a point in, in, in hyperbolic space. So how do we refer to a point? By its polar coordinates an angle, and a radius, okay? And this distance, the drawing, this Euclidean drawing distance, is an honest hyperbolic distance. So where are the points that are infinitely far away from the origin? Well, you know, they're at infinity, okay? This points in this uh, ball here, which is centered at the origin and has radius capital R, um, <clears throat> what I wanted to say. Um, <clears throat> okay, this, this, this is a ball centered at the origin of radius capital R. It's not like in the disk model. You know, the, now you can draw your points outside if you want, okay? You can draw your points outside, but in this ball, actually, since space is expanding so fast, uh, most of the area is, is very close to the boundary in the ball. And, uh, and still, you know, uh, the points in the boundary are very close to each other because you can always walk to the origin and then to the other point. Actually, if you wanna go from any, like from here to like here, usually you, just, you will go close to the origin and, the, and then back, okay? The perimeter of this ball, is some, it's exponential. You know, it's, 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 it's of exponential size. You will never want to go around. I mean, that's too far. Okay, that's the properties of hyperbolic space. So here's a comparison of both of them. <clears throat> um, this is the Poincaré this model. Uh, here's the boundary of it. There's nothing outside. And this is the native representation. It, you know, all of Euclidean space uh, represents points. And this is, a, a, I apply the, the real transformation, a point at distance y from the origin in the Poincaré this model is gonna be at this, rep it represents this hyperbolic distance and it's drawn at that distance from the origin, okay? So like this small area here between the boundary and this, this uh, disk of this dashed circle, you know, that small thing, well, that's everything now outside here because this boundary just got blown to infinity, and this got blown to here, and everything here is outside. All the points in here are inside. These are geodesics, and now they get distorted a bit, and they look like that, okay? So, <clears throat> so, so what? Uh, okay, so summarizing, hyperbolic space is, is awesome, you know, we live there, we could all have huge houses, huge patios, you know, everyone will be very close to each other. I mean, think of it, you will you will just walk a couple of steps, you go to whatever conference you want, seminars, your collaborators will be there, no need for cars, no carbon footprint, you know, it's next election, vote hyperbolic, okay? <clears throat> However, there are some, uh, you can even, draw your trees in, in the way you want. There are some dangers in, in hyperbolic land. Um, you can easily get lost, okay? So if, if you imagine you, you have a polynomial life, 
And you know, space expands exponentially. I mean, you can go and have a lot of uh, vacations, but uh, even you can explore very, li very little of your space. So, so if you just wander around, everything will look new and you might get lost. Um, so, so it's good to have a strategy for finding your way in hyperbolic space, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so finally, back to random hyperbolic graphs. What are they? Well, they were defined by this uh, group of physicists, so then we needed a, a group of mathematicians, actually, to, to make it rigorous. Um, and they, what I will work is the, um, with the, their, uh, their proposal of formalization. And in, in it, there are uh, three parameters, alpha, nu, and n. n is the number of points of the graph, uh, of the hyperbolic graph. And there's a very important parameter here that we will use, which is called, uh, which is r equal twice log n over n over n. So let me write it here. <clears throat> Okay, so now the analog of this uh, um, unit square uh, that we had for geometric graphs will uh, actually be the region here. Can, you cannot choose it the way you want it. It has to be a ball of radius r center at the origin. Again, native representation. This is not the disk model. So there are points outside will choose all our points inside this region, and the region has to be fixed, okay? It has to be a ball. It has to be a ball of that radius. You don't get to choose it, okay? And then we do what is expected. We, we uniformly at random choose n points in, in the ball. Uniformly at random according to the, to the, I mean, to the metric of the hyperbolic space. I mean, it's not, it's not that everything will, will look here like it's uniformly distributed. In hyperbolic space, most of the area is sort of to the boundary, so, so there's where most of the points will, will be there. And then there's another difference with geometric graphs. You know, two nodes uh, there's, are connected by an edge, and you don't get to choose the radius, you know, the, the distance that you compare to. It has to be, again, capital R, okay? So, so the region, Jaime, you missed the photo. Let's go back. You're, Jaime, you're in hyperbolic space. <laughs> okay, so, this, uh, so, 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 so you know that there's, it's, it's more constrained. Right? You don't choose the region. The parameters tell you what the region has to be. You don't choose the radius of the balls around each point. Uh, it has to be R, okay? Okay, so now uh, you can kind of be more formal about this and uh, since uh, hyperbolic space is, you know, it's independent, uh, you know, there's no um, asymmetry in, in the, in depending on the angle, you can think of choosing a point uh, uniformly here is like choosing an angle uniformly in zero and two pi, and between two pi, and then you have to choose a, a radius according to some density. And the right density comes out to be, you know, hyperbolic signs with a constant. You can forget about that. And it's essentially, you know, an exponential. Okay. This alpha that, I, so, so, okay, so look at this density. Um, when r is zero, so you're close to the origin, so your density is minimal. And when R is very close to the boundary, your density is maximum, okay? And I'll show you some pictures of how it works. Alpha, alpha is, um, 
is actually controls the rate of increase of, of, of space and gives you some liberty on the parameters. So there's also a soft version of, a, of a, this graph. You know, the typical physicists, they introduce a, a temperature parameter, and now they say, well, the probability of connecting between two nodes that are distance d, they, they will follow some logistic uh, law. The reason why they do this is that you know, you, now you are, it's not so restricted, the definition, but also they can study something, what happens when you know, they like to do this when temperature goes to infinity and when temperature goes to zero. But when temperature goes to infinity, this term is irrelevant and you get a, a G and P graph with P equals one half. And when temperature goes to zero, the only thing that matters is whether the distance is bigger or smaller than R. So you get uh, the model that, uh, that I just said. Okay, so here are some pictures of the density, just to, so you get a sense of it. Uh, when alpha is, is sort of small, um, this thing sort of smoothly grows when alpha equals to one. You know, it really it remains flat for a long time, but then it explodes near the boundary. So here is the, the same thing, look from on top. Um, you know, the, the, the hotter colors means that there are more points, okay? So that's a visualization of the density function. I also have to tell you how you compute distances in hyperbolic space, because if you have two points here and you have to figure whether you know they're connected by an edge, you need to know how to figure out what the distance between those points is uh, in, as, a, as a function of their, uh, their coordinates. So computing distances to the origin, that's trivial because you know, the radius is the hyperbolic distance to the origin. Computing distances uh, between other points is messy, <laughs> okay? So if you have the origin, if you have two points that are at right radius r u and r sub b, and they form an angle of phi u b, well, that's the hyperbolic law of sine tells you what that distance is, and you have to simplify from there. So that, you know, that looks scary. Um, because if you're gonna work with that, I mean, the approximations are gonna be maybe a little bit painful. Luckily, this doesn't matter too much. Uh, what is more useful is to figure out what is the maximum angle uh, at which two nodes that are at radius v and u, uh, what is the maximum angle that they can form and still be connected. So that we call this expression over here, and that's a much nicer thing. It's just you know, some formula. And it turns out that if the angle U and V form it's at most this, then they, they are connected, okay? Um, okay, finally, here are some examples of random hyperbolic graphs. Um, here, N equals to 500. Here there's different alphas. Alpha bigger means, you know, space expands faster. The area is towards the border. So here, as you can see, there are fewer points close to the center. Right? And as uh, points are uh, closer, uh, move closer, actually they're, they're uh, much more uh, connected. So uh, you can see here, for example, they are isolated nodes. And, and, and over here, well, I don't know if you see it, but uh, here actually there, there, there are some small components, uh, but disconnected. Okay? And I always talk between the range of one half and one, and later I'll tell you why. Here is a, the same thing, but the, now we're, we, we move nu, the second parameter. And, and this nu is actually proportional to the average degree of the, the graph that we will obtain. So you can see more edges as you move there. This r over here, right, it's divided by nu. So it, as nu increases, this r decreases. So the region where you're choosing your points, it's, 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 it's becoming smaller, so I, get, I hope you can see it. You know, this circle is smaller. That's not an illusion, okay? It should be smaller. Um, okay. Okay, so, you know, nice hyperbolic space and everything, but who cares, right? <clears throat> uh, well, there are many models of, uh, where people have tried to capture social networks. Um, I guess one of the most famous is this preferential attachment model. There are also this uh, um, um, 
Okay. <laughs> There's a, there's a Chu Liung model, there's this a Kleinberg model, and so on. But none of them actually exhibit two important properties that one finds in social networks. One of them is a scale freeness, and the other one is non negligible clustering. So, non negligible clustering sort of captures the fact that friend, my, uh, a pair of my friends tend to be friends between them. There's this local denseness to social networks, right? So it's more typical that two of my friends are friends than uh, in general. And, uh, and you know, all these models have been tweaked in some non-elegant way to, to kind of force them really to have these properties. But the random hyperbolic graphs really have it just out of the definition. So that's one reason. But then the other thing that really caught the attention and mostly by more applied people is this map. It's the same, it was done by the same group at the Qaeda, um, plus minus some people. And here what they took is the, um, the, the almost 24,000 internet providers throughout the world. You know, Qaeda monitors the, the internet, so they have a lot of data. Uh, autonomous systems are like big ISPs, like AT&T, Movistar, Sprint, uh, NTT. And they, you know, they figure out what the connections were them, certain type of connections between them. Um, and then they mapped it to a hyperbolic space by doing some naive maximum likelihood fit. And what they obtain is a very nice fit with an alpha equals 0 0.55, R equals 27, and a temperature of uh, 0.69, kind of the core regime. And you can see, like, you know, you, know you, you have things like what you expect. I mean, the big providers are close to the center, are the important ones. Then you have uh, geographically countries that are geographically close. For example, they, 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 they are close there. Those are the Nordic countries. Here are mostly North America. Brazil is, is, is pretty much in North America, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, Asia, and so it looks good, you know, for people say, well, wow, that, that's, uh, that's incredible. It's very hard to map the internet in a, and make a nice picture. So, so, so that, that was a, they caught attention. And the other thing is that, you know, one complicated aspect of, of the internet is uh, the routing protocol. We need this IP tables and have to keep them consistently uh, throughout time. And if you, if, if you can project the internet into hyperbolic space and everyone can figure out what their hyperbolic coordinates are, you can get rid of IP tables. You can do something very nice, which is just uh, greedy forwarding. I mean, you look at your neighbors. It's like Milgram's experiment. You look at your neighbors. You know, I want to send this somewhere. I know the coordinates of the hyperbolic space where I want to send it, or approximately. And I just look at my neighbors and see, well, who's closer to that destination? And I just send the message to them and ask them to send it, uh, keep on sending it that way. Okay, so it's a, it's a very simple uh, uh, protocol. And it turns out that they, well, with non-experimentally, not data not real, um, it performs surprisingly well. Um, you know, it has a, without playing any tricks of like backtracking or patching or anything, it, it, it really has a very large success, probably. And uh, even more, the, it kind of finds, it doesn't find the shortest path, but essentially goes through paths that are pretty much that length, very small stretch. OK? So, so, so that's, that's awesome. <clears throat> so I guess that's the end of the first part. Um, how much time do I have? Huh? 20. Euclidean or hyperbolic time? <laughs> uh, I prefer hyperbolic. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so let me show you some, some of the math involved in, analy in analyzing this stuff. Um, first, we do a trick that is typical of a, a, the study of geometric random graphs. We, we Poissonize. And, and, and the reason we, we do this is that um, <clears throat> The, um, the way we define random hyperbolic graphs it has uh, something that it's annoying to work with. If, if in this region, for example, I tell you that you have a lot of points, let's say you, every point is there, then what happens outside is not independent. 
Now you know there are no points outside. Is, uh, that's kind of messy. So, so a, a typical trick in, uh, is to do the following. You, you will assume actually that you know, points will kind of appear in, in this area. And you will get the right average. You might get more, less, but you get the right average. Okay? So, so it's just like trees growing up. You know, they, they, they appear there. And uh, the, only, the, the thing that you ask is that uh, you know, the number of, of, of trees or points that you get in a region are going to be proportional to the area of the region and independent of disjoint regions. Okay? So, so you, you, you have it that overall you get the right amount uh, of points. And in each region, you get sort of n expected number that you get is n times the area of the region. And that's equivalent, actually, to another thing, to saying just the number of points that you observe in a region follows some Poisson distribution with expectation like n times the area. And that's the distribution of a Poisson. Okay, and the nice thing now is that sort of you have independence. And the, the important fact of this, well, there are two important facts. One of them is that, and to keep in mind, because I will not go into the, for, the painful formulas, just if this area is large, then the number of points you have in that area is very concentrated and very close to the expectation. This with extremely high probability, I mean, you know, it's one minus one over a polynomial, whatever the polynomial you want to choose. But if the measure is small, well, this thing, you only get, you don't get the precise value of, of, of number of points you have, but it's small. Formally, if the area is bigger than, grows like somewhat bigger than one over n, then it's very close to the expectation. If not, well, you, the only thing that you can say is it's logarithmically small, polylogarithmic. And the good thing about this model, you have this independence, and actually whatever you can prove in this model can translate back. You lose something, but it doesn't matter what you lose. It's very little. So, so well, I'll just work on this model. I'll also, hence for only, assume alpha is between 1 half and 1. So you shouldn't forget that. I, I don't want to write it in every slide. I, I'll just assume, and this is an interesting regime. I'll probably forget to explain why, so you can, that's one question you can ask me at the end. <clears throat> okay, so, so let's uh, do the following. Let's, let's figure out how many vertices we have at distance i from, uh, from the origin. So we'll call this a layer. We have a ball of radius i and uh, we subtract a ball of radius one less. Uh, some calculations that some people have already done for us say that the area of that ball is essentially, this means like one plus little or one, it's this. And since, since most, all of the ball, you know, all of what I've been saying is that most of the area of a ball is in the boundary, this shouldn't be so surprising. This layer essentially has an area which is just a constant of the whole. It's, it's, it's a small factor of, of this whole ball. So, so the points in, in this region will be mostly around this layer. Okay? And in expectation, there will be n times this thing over here. So, so let's call this the number of points we have at distance i from the origin. And let's do the following exercise. Um, we want to know for which value of i this thing is like one over n. So that we call i zero. So this ball has an area which is one over n. The number of points we expect to see in there, in there is n times the area. So it's one, okay? <clears throat> So we expect to see at, at this distance from the origin the one node. If we are a little bit before that, you know, we shouldn't see anything. So, so up to this distance, we really have nothing there, okay? Then if we move a little bit past that distance, you know, the expectation is bigger than one, and, and we find the first nodes. So the first nodes are going to be at this distance. Okay, so now let's move far away and let's move to the boundary. We are a constant 
away from the boundary. If we substitute i by this expression r minus a constant, we get a constant, essentially. So what we'll have is in this layer, we'll have essentially linear number of nodes, okay? So most of the nodes in our graph are really very close to the boundary, a constant distance from the boundary. Uh, what do I want to do? Okay, so that, that will kind of tells you where the points are. Very few at the center, then something appears, most of the nodes are gonna be in the boundary. Now I want to uh, figure out what are the degrees of the nodes, and that's gonna depend on, on where, where they are. So for that, you need to understand what the balls of radius R are. This is amazing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so these are the balls in hyperbolic space. Uh, it's, you know, they, they are, they're amazing. Mm -hmm. so, so since everything is so close by, this point is always a distance less than R from the origin. So the origin is, is in every ball here. So if there was a point at the, the origin, it would be connected to everything. But the thing is that usually there's no point at the origin, okay? Now, most of the area of this ball is actually here because space expands exponentially. So really, the area of this ball intersecting the region that we are, and we, we, we want, we are interested in, it, it's just, it falls exponentially with the distance to the origin. So it's very small over here. But the number of neighbors a node will have is proportional to this ball, right? Right? So it turns out that if a node is close to the origin, it will have very high degree. And if it's close to the boundary, very small degree. Um, so that's what we get. You know, if we are, at a radius uh, uh, r sub p, and then you know the, the ball has a very large area, then because of this fact that I said the degree is very highly concentrated and it's that thing, otherwise if we're close to the boundary, we can only say it's a, you know, it will have a small degree. <clears throat> and with that, we get a whole bunch of stuff. Um, you know, where is gonna be the maximum degree node? It's gonna be where, where the first node appears. Yeah, at I zero, you have to have the first node. And that turns out that the maximum degree will be that. The nodes, the degree will, of a node is gonna be given by the, essentially the, the distance to the origin it has. So if you work out things, you get that there, there will be this number of degree K nodes, of degree at most K nodes. And if you work out how many nodes of degree K there will be, well, it will be some one over K to the, uh, this shouldn't be a minus, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah, this should, yeah, this should be, sorry, that's not, uh, that's a plus. So the number of nodes that will have, um, degree exactly k would be proportional to one over k to the two alpha plus one. So remember, alpha was between one half and one, so now this is between two and three. That's you know, what people say, uh, complex networks, uh, they, they have their exponents. Um, the average degree will turn out to be, you know, we have, now we have the whole distribution. I mean, we, it's some calculation, but one can do it we get that the average degree is proportional to this parameter nu. If we look at nodes that are uh, close to the boundary, a constant distance, then their degree, you can figure out exactly their degree follows a Poisson distribution, and this is the value of the, the probability of the degree being zero. So, so there's a fraction of isolated vertices. And, and also, uh, and I didn't say this, but this is kind of obvious, if you're a distance of most out over two from the origin, all the points over there, they form a clique because they're a distance R from each other. You just go to the origin and then move to the other point. And we got all that from this analysis. You can also be a little bit more uh, finer and, <clears throat> and compute, you know, the distribution of your neighbors. You know, where are they gonna be? If I'm at point P, how many neighbors will I have here? Well, almost every point inside this ball is gonna be here. 
So, so essentially the number of points you have here is, 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 is the number of, of neighbors that you have at distance i from the origin. And if you figure that out, then it turns out that this, uh, the number of neighbors that you have is increases as, as i in, uh, increases. So you have more neighbors towards the boundary. There's where people are, essentially, not towards the origin. Okay, so now here you can visualize, hopefully, everything that I've said so far. So, um, so let's get back to the. So initially, we have, this is the drawing that I made before. Here, you will have um, distance out over two from the origin. Everything inside has to be a clique. This is the boundary. And here are like uh, uh, three, three different neighbors. And the, uh, these edges are three different points. And these this edges are the neighbors of these points. So as you see, they have a, whole, a lot of neighbors at the end at the, in, towards the boundary. OK? And now we'll rotate this thing. Um, and the, 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 the c-axis will be the logarithm of 1 plus the degree. And since the degree is uh, falling at an exponential rate, you know, you get these nice triangles, essentially, right? So, so the different layers are the different degrees. You see a lot of neighbors at the end. You get this shape because you're plotting there the logarithm of 1 plus the degree. You get isolated nodes are the ones over here, right? Uh, you can see a, a lot of them. And also these orange ones, well, they are not part of the giant component. Okay, so you, there's one big connected component and there's lots of uh, isolated components. Okay. Ah, no. <laughs> Oops. Uh, Let me skip this. And let me tell you a little bit about the giant component. <clears throat> the typical thing that people study in Erdos Rangi graph, so it's a natural question to, to ask here. Um, here, what you can uh, figure out is the following. Um, I'll just be not, not very technical. But if, if you're at uh, some, some distance from, from the boundary, then um, it's likely that you have a neighbor that is, you know, um, whose distance to, to, to the boundary is increases by a factor, okay? So, so think of tau being bigger than one. You are here, you have some distance like there to the boundary, and you have some probability of jumping closer to the origin. If you're, if you're far away enough from the boundary, it's almost sure you can do the jump and you will find a neighbor there. So, so if you're far enough from the boundary, it's, you know, it's, it's almost impossible not to have this uh, neighbor closer to the origin and fairly closer to the origin. And you just jump uh, very few steps, <coughs> log, log n steps, and you will find yourself in the, in the clique in the middle here. So, so if you're away from the boundary, you're very close to the clique. Um, so all of these points that are like a log, log n from the boundary, you know, they, they are very close to the clique in log log n steps. That, lo that looks huge, actually. But it's not. You know, really hyperbolic space, most of the points are in that strip. So here you only have like n over poly log n number of nodes. So, so the points that are at distance within a constant of the boundary, well, they only have constant probability of connecting to this region, but also by these jumps that are big. So, so those points have only constant probability of connecting here. They're at log log n distance of here, so they're log log n distance of this. A typical vertex then is at distance log log n from the clique. So average distance here is log log n. And you have a linear number of, a, not of nodes in the a component that connects to the clique. That doesn't say that you don't have other components that are of linear size. So that's a joint work with, uh, 
with Mitche, uh, Dieter Mitche from University of Nice, that we showed that the second component has a, its at most order polylog a, n. Um, and uh, how much time? Five. Five? Okay. So, uh, um, okay, so I'll, I'll tell you just one more thing. Um, there's a very nice observation of Frederick and Cromer about the forbidding configurations. So if this is the origin and you have two points here that uh, are connected and another point inside this angle, then there has to be, these two edges have to be there. And if you have two points here connected and other two uh, points, nodes, within this angle, then uh, at least, you know, these edges have to be there, okay? So, so you cannot have like, you know, if you have this edge, you have to have the other two. Okay? That's kind of useful. The geometry uh, plays, plays a role here. So, <clears throat> um, okay, so <laughs> bear with me five minutes, okay? Um, so, so now you can argue in the following way in order to try to bound the diameter and of, the, of this, this graph. If you, if you move far away, um, here we will move at r equals r minus log n r times one minus alpha. The number of points that you, you should see in that layer, well, we have this formula. You plug it into that formula and you get that the number of points should be n, uh, n over log n to the one, of, one over one minus alpha n, okay? So that's uh, sort of the number of points that you expect to see there. So if they were all neatly laid down and distributed, you will expect to see a point uh, in this layer at uh, kind of this angle, right? The inverse of this. You take the number of points you have, one over two pi over that is gonna be essentially uh, the angle that they, between one and each other, if everything was lied down very well. Now, since most points are over here, that tells you that usually this area will be empty. This whole area will not have points. And now you can say, well, that's in average, right? But well, if you, if you, if you look at K sectors like this, K being like polylog, then it's almost impossible that you will not find a point uh, inside this area. So most of the time it will be empty, but in average you will have sort of one point and you expect that if you take K large enough, not too large for logarithmic, you will, you will see a point over there. <clears throat> so that's what I'm saying. This is different than empty, it's, it's gonna be unlikely. And then in this region over here, you do the computation also and you get the polylog number of, of points. So why does that give you a bound on the diameter? And this is a, a joint. The first polylogarithmic bound on the diameter was done by, also in collaboration with uh, Dieter Mitche. It was uh, really simplified in an embarrassing way by <laughs> Frederick and Kramer very shortly after, uh, who, who uh, brought down the exponent of the polylogarithmic and recently announced a result by Tom, uh, uh, Tobias Mueller and, and one of his students that it's actually order log n. So, so, so the reason why I, what I just said actually gives you a bound on the diameter is that, well, you take these regions and these regions, you know, they have to have points. Now assume you have a very large, and, and all of this region actually we know everything is connected within order log log n here. You know, they're very connected very shortly. So the only way to have a very large diameter is to have a very large path over here, right? Now, if you have a very large path over here, well, then, you know, there are not so many points over there. There are polylogarithmic number of points. So, so, so if you look for more points in order to make the diameter longer, you have to go to this region over here. But if you have to pass through this region because of this forbidden structures that I just said, you have to have an edge that goes from here to here and you will connect to one of this. 
So, so it's a very naive bound. The diameter is going to be bounded by the maximum number of kind of points you can have here. And that gives you a polylogarithmic bound. It's easy to derive from there <clears throat> a polylogarithmic bound on, on the second component. Uh, we think also with uh, Dieter Mitchell we have a, a sharp bound, uh, a sharp characterization of what uh, that is. Another thing I've done here, I just mentioned it, it's, uh, it's um, we determine the exact uh, kind of a, a eigenvalue gap of a, this, this random hyperbolic graphs and the conductance of it. There's a relation between, if you know what the spectral gap is and, and, and conductance, there's a relation due to Cheeger between both terms. This, this is important because they kind of um, quantify the bottlenecks that you have in, 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 in random hyperbolic graphs, also the mixing time is related to these quantities, and we, we nail down precisely what these values are. And it turns out that the main bottleneck, or you know, the sparsest cut, is actually one that looks like where you divide the whole thing in half. You know, so, so, so the bottleneck for sending information from here to here is just getting through the clique. And usually you have a much better conductance in these regions over here. So we also characterize that. You know, the only way of, of, of reaching this, uh, this upper bound is actually uh, through these cuts that uh, look like this. So there are other results that due to time I will not uh, mention, but you can ask questions about that. Some of them tree width and so on. And uh, I'll just leave you with some of my favorite questions uh, that I think are really worth uh, understanding. Uh, I would like to see a compelling model of how this, uh, you know, one nice thing of this preferential attachment model of, uh, <coughs> of uh, Barabasi and Albert is that, you know, it sort of explains how this, uh, <coughs> this networks kind of evolve. And here we don't have a, this, this is a very kind of fixed deterministic, the random hyperbolic graph model. Um, model of a network, I would like to see something, you know, how does these things actually arise, evolve, and die? Um, there's very little understanding, and this is why we undertook this uh, analysis, this study of, of conductance and mixing times. There's very, we don't still have a good understanding of how information propagates through this thing. Although we, in a very recent paper, uh, greedy routing was really formally analyzed and shown to have very good properties. Um, and luckily, unfortunately, I didn't have time to, to talk about that. And then another one which <clears throat> I really like is that, you know, you, a graph defines naturally a graph metric, which is the shortest path. But here we have an underlying metric. And you know you will expect that in this model, like when n goes to infinity, you converge. The graph metric converges to the hyperbolic metric. Um, I think that's not true, um, but uh, I would like to have a clear understanding of when it's not true and why. Okay, and yeah, thanks for your attention. <laughs> <clears throat>